entertaining, informative, and educational, inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. Work, 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 work. Hello, boys. Have a good night's rest. I miss you. Okay. Welcome to another episode of Brett's Perfection. I'm Kenny Troiano, founder of the Breeders Academy, and I'm here with my co-host, Frank Bradley, and my wife, Nancy. How you guys doing? Do you guys have a hey, good hey. Uh, Halloween? Hey, is it just me or does it feel like we was gone uh, longer than a week? Does it, does. it feel that? Yeah, it yeah. feels like we, forever. Yeah. We it, were, weren't we? Just a no, week. No, we're only gone one just week. week. Okay. And um, I could feel it from my members and the followers. They acted the same way that we were gone forever, you know? It seems like so, it. It really does. Yeah. I lost count of how many people said, I'm missing the show. So I'm going to go binge. The podcast <laughs> and some of the live shows that's on there. The members can actually go into the back end and binge the whole archive of videos if they want to. I only keep a handful on YouTube itself these days, but uh, you can listen to the majority of the shows on the podcast side. And uh, for some of you that don't know that, we obviously we have the live show here, but we also have a podcast that you can go to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, just about anywhere you listen to your podcast and uh get the whole show and uh although a lot of the early shows were me and nancy you know teaching and then frank come on came on board after that uh basically the shows that we put on nowadays are um they're basically the live show edited down to a nice tight show which i think is really cool so but um yeah, we had a really good October. It's going to be sad. Usually October is not my favorite month, but we had such a good October that I'm looking forward to the next one. But we're going to make November a good one, too. Right, guys? Yep. Yeah, that's the bit. You know, that's just November's just a good chicken year uh, month in itself. So, well, I hate to say it wasn't about the chickens this time. It was all the other things that we were doing that was just so much fun. You know, it's all about Halloween in some ways, but we took Halloween to the whole nother level with the uh, places we were going to. So we had good time, such a good time that we're gonna we're gonna do more uh, next year. But um, 
you know, Chase, one of my members, as a lot of you guys know, uh, came over the other day to help me paint my fascia. And it was so funny. You'd think while he was here, we'd be talking chickens, chicken, chickens. And it wasn't so. We were actually talking more about, because he built his own business. Matter of fact, he built a few of them. We spent the whole time he was here talking about business, how to build a business, how to run a business, marketing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he really enjoys you know, my insight on how to build a business and the way I built the Breeders Academy and Bread to Perfection and the way I market it. And he's he's implementing everything that I'm teaching him and everything I've done with my business on his business, and he's getting really good results. So I'm so glad to help him there. But you'd think it would be about chickens, but it wasn't. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> guys, I, I'm just I'm I'm reading this and I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Good night, guys. Pleasure to be on the live show. Are you leaving us already, Jason? <laughs> so Might have to get gonna... up early for work. That caught me off guard, but uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. No, you know what else I'm thinking about is what you said before about how the guys, since we weren't on last week, they were binge listening to all of our other episodes. And in the Breeders Academy, you can binge for hours because we have everything archived in there. Um, but one other thing they were also was saying is they re-listened to episodes and they were catching things that they missed the first time that they had listened to it. So it's, it's really good to go back and re-listen to a lot of episodes. Cause you never know, you miss little golden nuggets that you thought you heard, or, you know, you, you were thinking about something else while we were saying something and just completely missed it. So well, yeah, it's good that's, for you to that's go back. What they were saying. They were saying that, uh, they were going back and listening to the old, like the master's class videos. And I, I saw a couple of them say that it was amazing. They were amazed at how many times they've already listened to them. Then went, went back and listened to them again. They were seeing things that they missed. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, that Aaron come up with a post on the, the Breeders Academy uh, group page and was saying that. Yeah. So that's what I encourage you guys to do because we throw, I don't think people on the outside, who are not members realize how much information we give in those videos that I do recommend that you listen to them over and over again, because you are going to miss something and we're, some things are going to come clear that weren't clear before. So definitely. And I'm still getting people uh, signing up for coaching calls and then canceling because they got their answer inside the Beers Academy with the videos, especially. We had uh, two or three, uh, Cancel them on the back end. Uh, the last uh, the last show we done on the back end, there was two or three canceled their coaching calls because of that. Yeah. So the, that's the nice thing about doing the videos. And we're going to try to do more because it does answer their questions. And as much as I love doing the coaching calls, you know, um, it's it's nice to know that the information in the Breeders Academy is answering their questions. So uh, so anyways. Just recently, about a week ago, I was a guest on a show called NWA Canna Corsos. Okay. And it's a dog show. It's a, he does a really good job, and he has some really good interviews with these guys. And uh, he had me on, and we were talking about the how the, the – fun. basically, we were talking about the fundamentals of breeding and how it applies to all animals because he know as he knows, that we mostly talk about chickens. But we have so many different breeders or types of breeders inside the Breeders Academy that it's for them. It's not all about chickens they are able to actually take the information that we provide and use it for their animals too. And Joe who runs this, um, uh, was it a YouTube channel said the same thing. And he's been trying to, you know, he's been telling everybody he can think of, and we're getting more and more dog breeders in there, which is really cool. So I never plan on it being a website for anything other than chickens, but it's, a, it's kind of neat that the, they're finding, uh, the information useful, Frank. Yeah, well, you know, I've said it a million times. I actually got started uh, uh, chicken breeding with dog breeding books. So yeah. uh, I think there's there's a method and a breeding program is just that in itself. A good whole breeding program that goes into circles. You can use it for many things, just like the Founders Program. It doesn't have to be all about chickens. Of course, the species, some part of the species may change in, in different parts, but the methods are still related and the same. Uh, to, you know, to make a pure family of anything. Yeah. Uh, also, I'm going on again, the same show, 
And uh, we're going to have a discussion with him, myself, and some of the other breeders as he's interviewed before. And again, we're going to go into the fundamentals of breeding, probably compare the differences between dog breeding and chicken breeding and the methods that we use and how they are similar. So I'm really looking forward to that. We, hopefully, uh, we'll be, that'll air soon. Um, I don't know if he's planning on doing that live or not, but I know I'm going to record it on the 18th. So watch out for that. Um, we um, now we are having uh, the. I don't know. We did talk about the Black Friday sale last week, right? Or last time? Yes, the pretty sure we touched on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not open yet, but what we plan on doing is offering. It'll be a three-year program where you basically join for two years and you get the third year free. And uh, I may open that up next week. It's not open now, and I. I'm not sure if we're going to do it next week or not, but I think we're going to try. It's either going to be next week or the week after that, that we're going to do a uh, website tour, kind of give you guys an idea what's in the website and update it because the website tour that's on the website right now, or even on YouTube is uh, it's the website's changed quite a bit. So I think it's important that we do it again. Well, uh, well, we could have actually done it way back sooner because I'll tell you, uh, from, I don't know, probably six months in from the last one, probably four months in it, we yeah. was ready to do another one, but then you'd, you know, put so much more work videos and with the masterclass videos. So yeah, we'll, we'll well overdue for a, for a new one. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you guys know, uh, we're going to do the first hour for the public. It'll be on purity of blood. And is it, a reachable goal. So we're going to discuss that. It seems like I'm seeing it pop that particular topic popping up all over the internet. It seems like a good one to address. And uh, what I've been doing is putting uh, shows on, um, or not shows, I'm getting a little distracted here, banners on my Facebook page and then letting people discuss it. And then we come in here and just, you know, discuss it a little further and maybe answer your question. So the first hour will be about purity of blood and whether or not it's an uh, achievable um, goal. And in the back end, we're going to talk about how evolution affects selective breeding. And it's, it's a topic that we've covered before, but again, I, it was a banner that I put on Facebook and it got a really good reaction. So we're going to discuss it. I, I love discussing that topic, Frank. It's, it's a fun one. It's uh it's very intellectual, but yet once you understand it, it's very practical and usable. So um, I'm always trying to find, and, and let me say this real quick too. And one of the reasons I want to do it because I've been seeing other breeders, other shows discussing the same thing. And for a while there, I thought I was the only one that got that. <laughs> you know what I mean? That I only, I was the only one that saw the connection. And I did, one was actually a dog breeder and he was making the connection between evolution and selective breeding, but he, he got a lot right, but there was one thing he got wrong and uh, it was a shame. I was uh, kind of bummed when he got that one wrong, but it's nice to see that other people are seeing what I'm seeing. Yeah. Well, I think with the evolution though, it just shows you how important and how fast selective breeding can be and how we can mold anything really uh, in a correct breeding program. You can do basically whatever you want. I mean, it's unlimited what you can do with it. If you've got the knowledge and know-how uh, you can take a good breeding program and make some pretty, uh, Fast drives comparing it to evolution, of course. There's so many similarities. And if you can understand evolution and how it operates and how those mechani mechanisms make a difference, um, it really it really helps you understand. It's like the breeding. And it helps you understand, like, when, especially when you look at, like, the Founders Program. When you take apart the Founders Program, you see so many similarities with um, evolution that because of that, you understand why we're doing the, what we're doing in the founders program and why the fowl are actually progressing under a system like this. Whereas you look at other breeding programs, they're just not getting the same results. Matter of fact, they're spinning their wheels. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. It, it's, it's so important, you know, of uh, we preach this kick it, you know, pretty much like a dead horse, but the thing <laughs> yeah. about it is, uh, and I say this quite often, we don't go into the woods and see sick birds, um, uh, sick animals in the forest. Usually, usually the birds or the animals we see in the forest is all in good health. Uh, they they look the way they're supposed to be. They're they're free from sickness. So uh, that's one part we can take from that 
really. Uh, we got a lot of people out there breeding sick birds. Uh, that's one thing you can take away from it. Uh, Mother Nature will never put up with sickness ever. No. We, uh, we breed a lot of animals that we shouldn't be breeding, and that's for sure. Okay, so even though you're not going to join the Breeders' Academy, make sure to go to www.breedersacademy.com. There you can uh, join my newsletter, which we call the Breeders' Bulletin. You're going to get a lot of free tips, some eBooks that are free. And uh, so make sure to do that. Then uh, you can decide after that whether you want to become a Breeders' Academy member. We are, like I said, the website is open right now for new enrollment. Um, I usually close the website. We're not doing that for a while because of the new way we're doing the show. We got the front end and the back end. A lot of people were getting a little discouraged that they wanted to see the back end and they weren't able to get in there. So I made it available for them to go ahead and get in. So we're going to leave that open for a while. That's one of the reasons I decided to do the, the Black Friday sale that we are doing because part of the Black Friday before was to actually open up this, the website. Now it's open. And we're giving you a great deal, so I, I really behoove you to do it because it's a, uh, it's a great, um, it's a great deal actually. So, um, anything you guys want to talk about before we get into the topic? I'm ready. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. You know, I forgot one thing. So, I'll tell you what, let me get the outline ready to go. We're gonna play an advertisement. We'll be right back. This show is brought to you by the Breeders Academy where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, I'll provide you a roadmap that you will need to create a true family restraint. Starting with a cock from one breeder and a hen from another breeder, no problem. We can help you to turn your flock of hybrid crosses or mongrels into a pure family restraint and show you how to continually improve that strain each generation. We'll start by showing you how to select your seed fowl and how to turn that seed fowl into a high quality foundation strain. Our proven breeding programs and specialty courses are designed to take you step by step through the breeding process. And best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel at any time. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. Okay, the question of the day, is purity of blood a reachable goal? And if so, what's the criteria of putting, of creating a pure, uh, <laughs> totally messed that up. <laughs> and if so, what's the criteria of purity of blood? Got some editing to do there. <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned a while ago, Kenny, uh, that some people uh, was talking about this and got you to where you wanted to discuss it. So, and the ones that saying that there's no such thing as purity of blood. Really, if you look at it the way they do, they're right. Because nine times out of 10, when they say there's no such thing as purity of blood, they're talking about pure Kelsos, pure Hatch, pure uh, lacy round heads, pure madigans. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about pure of traits, tr uh, 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 pure of breed. Uh, they look at it as pure of whatever name they call the bird. So I think that's a lot of the misconceptions that we see out there when you're talking about purity of blood. The name game and those yeah. names never existed. So they're trying to, if they're even trying to, breed purity of blood according to the name they're never going to get there there's no such thing but that's no. not what we're talking about at all so and Nancy, that, you want to that, 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 that's basically what i was wanting you to start out with you might want to start out with you know letting them know what we, we call purity of blood i guess say yeah yeah nancy i'm looking at your notes on my thing you're supposed to be uh checking yeah. something out well, that's what I did. I I switched over from YouTube to the docs because I, I wasn't sure where you were. So I was like constantly you know, scrolling really quick. All right. So we are talking about. Oh, I was going to ask show, Nancy. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to ask the chat room guys, what is what constitutes purity of blood to you? So I want to hear what you guys have to say. What constitutes purity of blood? So that's what I was saying earlier in the chat room, guys. I want to hear you chatting up tonight. 
Give me some answers. Okay. So th that's the question, but what's the answer, Frank? Uh, no. Don't say the answer no. yet. No, we're going to work on the answer. <laughs> the answer is definitely not what Frank said, other people, the way other people see it, but there is an answer, and the answer is yes. Um, so I guess the first question would be um, they must represent their breed. That's the main thing, Frank. That's the number one thing because you can't call it an American game if it looks like a, a, a silky, okay? It, you just can't. I mean, it has to represent what it was made for. That's the characteristics that it should have. It's the breed. Whatever that bird was made for, bred for, is what it should represent. Yeah. Um, there's so many criteria, and we're going to go through them one at a time, but if they don't represent their breed, um, then, I mean, what are we doing? I mean, we can create our own strains. We can create our own breeds. We can take them in different directions. We've talked about it before, like the the breeders in the Philippines. I mean, they want to go so much in a, they want to go so far in a different direction, but hang on to the names. Why don't they just make their own breed? And they can call them the Filipino you know, the Philippines Gamecock or something like that or whatever they want to do. But uh, so it, it it's important that we breed them in such a way that they do represent their breed. The other one, Frank, is that they got to be predictable. So when we breed them such a way, we know what we're going to get, you know. That's uh, that's the reason yeah. I do it. Yeah. that That's the biggest reason I do it because um, so many times before coming up in the years breeding chicken, you know, you'd breed uh, one particular hen, one particular clock. It was supposed to have been peer this or peer that with the name labeled onto it. And, you know, you'd get good, bad, mediocre, just downright awful, mutated, uh, you know, junk, I guess you could say. But with purity of blood, when, the, when those chicks come out, as long as they're healthy and taken care of and you're doing your part, the majority of them is going to be as good or better as their parents that that's the biggest thing for me is the birds can reproduce themselves and yep. they're predictable that that's that's what makes me a, a peer to a blood type person because uh, it saves you a lot of uh of uh colon saves you a lot of money and a lot of time yeah we say it all the time i mean they got to be uniform consistent so they and they have to repeat themselves and Part of that is being predictable so that when we breed them, that we know what we're going to get when we, uh, you know, hatch out the offspring. There's no real surprises. Is there going to be some variation here and there? Yeah. I mean, it's there's a lot of variation in these birds already. It's going to take a while to, the get to, to get to the point when we're not seeing that kind of variation popping up from time to time. Uh, the genome is just full of different breeds. You know, and we can weed through them. We can knock out some of the homozygous dominant genes. And sometimes we're stuck with the recessive genes. And sometimes even worse, we're stuck with some uh, not only recessive, but recessive defects and some lethals. But we weed through them to a point when they're starting to breed themselves in such a way that they are uniform, consistent, repeatable and predictable. And when you got when you get to that point, when you're getting that kind of predictability, then you can say you have a pure strain. Because a lot of people ask me, well, you know, how do you know when you're they're pure? What means, what, what does it mean to have purity of blood? And that's almost it in a nutshell. I mean, we can break it down a little more and we're going to, but that's that's the uh, the criteria right there. Uniformity, consistency, repeat, repeatability, and predictable. Uh, if you're getting a lot of, ex, you know, a lot of contrasting characteristics coming out of them, uh, some are passing pea combs, some are straight combs, some are yellow legs, some are green leg. You've got, uh, uh, they're supposed to be gray, but they're still passing a lot. Uh, a good percentage of them are red. Uh, to me, that's not a family. And Frank, I think you're right when you said in the beginning that it, it's the pure, it's the, the name game that knocks them off track. And they, because of that name, they can't concentrate like they need to on the characteristics. So they never get to a, that kind of state of purity. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. And I think that that holds a breeder back. So I, to me, I think that's really the biggest part of breeding that holds a lot of breeders back that could be really good breeders if they would just put that out of the, what, out of the way and breed to the birds they're selecting rather than looking for the name they want. Yeah. So like 
someone was asking me recently, what traits are we talking about when we're talking about purity of blood? Well, it goes back to what we're saying. They need to represent their breed. And what does that mean? They have this, they have to have certain traits that represent that breed. So type, when we look at the type of the bird, a lot of people don't understand what type means. We we see this as a term used in all animal breeding, all breeding of different animals. It doesn't have to just be chickens. We we you know, you look at the dog breeding, they talk about type. You talk about cattle, pigs. It's all about type. Type is basically the shape of the bird. And if I were to look at, compare like a, um, let's say a, an American game with, let's say an ASIL. Okay. They have a completely different type. So we were to take pictures of these things, darken them out till we, till we have a silhouette. You're going to see two quite different birds. So if someone's calling a bird, and they think it's American game, but it doesn't match that certain type. It's not American game. And the worst thing you can do is breed a lot of what a lot of birds that don't have the proper type to the point when they're not the breed anymore. So you're looking at type, you're talking about conformation of body, uh, comb type, although, although some breeds uh, have different types of combs. But so when we have a um, we have contrasting characteristics that are representative of the same breed then now we're looking at variation. So you have to make up your mind. Do you want a peak comb family or do you want a straight comb family? And there's other breeds that have the same thing. Um, I think it's uh, Rhode Island Reds as one that have a straight comb or what they call a single comb, and they have a rose comb, I believe it is. So you can have different comb types per the breed, but it can't be in the same family. So you have to make a decision. So co comb type becomes one of those traits that you're going to select for. Leg color is the same thing as comb type. The leg color, is a, it changes it from uh, being just a strain, the breed, it makes it the variety too. Same thing with color of plumage is a you know, silver duck wing, a red, a blue, those are all varieties. And then performance ability and production ability. But to have all those coming predictable is what's important. And that's what makes up the breed, that makes up the variety and makes up the strain and decides whether it is a pure family. Yeah, that's, that's true, Kenny. And also, too, uh, I think the problem is, is a lot of people can't see that. Um, I had to work with it for many years, but once you learn it, it never goes away. Uh, a lot of people, Kenny, uh, and you probably will agree with me on this, you can put uh, a tight picture up, just the silhouettes of the birds of an old English, and then put one up of a modern game, and a lot of people can't depict the difference between the two. Now, somebody with a trained eye automatically can say, well, this is the American game. This is the old English. They know the difference in them. They can see the different shapes of them. Uh, but there, a lot of people there can. There you go, right here. There you go. Yeah. I mean, that's the difference between like an American game to a modern, but they're both game foul. And a lot of people get stuck. I mean, look at the difference between, let's say, the old English versus American mm -hmm. game. You can see the difference there. OK, um, what's a good another good one? Now, I don't have a, a comparison here with the American game with alongside of a cell, but you can see they're quite different birds. But when you look on Internet, there's the birds are actually taking on more of an uh, a cell look, maybe even a Peruvian look. Do I have that here? Here's a Peruvian right here. They're start, this is what they're starting to look like, if you ask me. The American game is turning into this more than ever. Look at the body shape. Okay, look at the type overall. Look at the tail. It's a it's a squawny. Uh, what's a good? Uh, um, it's a it's a smaller tail that lays further down. Okay, we're tighter talking feathered. about more, yeah, tighter feathered, more meteor type bird, and it has completely different type than what we see in the American game. So if you were to compare that with what's another good example? And the Peruvians are huge birds. That they can go up to 13, 14 pounds. I mean, they're just yeah. huge birds. But they're just adding them into the American game like you wouldn't believe. Like, here's what I was talking about here, where you have an American game. If you were to darken out the uh, the picture, you would have a certain shape. And every breed, every, yeah, every breed has a different shape. And that's what makes up the breed. Okay. So, um, where do I want to go now? But now, so when I, you go to Facebook, they're all, if, if you've done the silhouettes, just like you've done, if you went on Facebook and say you've done the first 20 birds that you come across. None of them would match each other. Every one of them is going to be different as far as that silhouette Kenny just showed. But the problem is, is some don't grasp this. Okay. But then you have some that are considered authorities who I think they do grasp it, but they don't want to accept it. 
and they and I don't know if it's just because they don't they can't meet the criteria themselves, so they don't think anybody else should, uh, so they don't want to teach it. So they actually discourage people from breeding towards not only pure blood, but for a bird that actually sh represents its breed and the characteristics that we've been talking about. Hey, Here's Kenny, there. do you have the Herbert Atkinson's quote? Oh, yeah. Good one. If I can find it here. I got so many <laughs> things on here now that, uh, okay, so here we go. Robbie's on top of it today. Yeah. So Herbert Atkinson says, do not, I pray you, to improve the true gamecock by adding, exaggerating, or making points which true specimens of the breed do not already possess. And that was a warning that he did in the late 1800s. And one we should be paying attention to right now because we're seeing this happening right before our eyes, the way people are breeding them, selecting them, the way they're perpetuating them. They either want to change them, which is fine, but make them different, or they just don't know what they're doing, just adding new blood, thinking that this other breed is going to improve them, which nine times out of ten, it doesn't. The improvements they think they're getting isn't breed characteristics. It's actually, actually hybrid vigor, which is neither um, – you can't repeat it and you can't pass it. And it's, it's not something that it's not inheritable. So it's a one-time deal. You get the hybrid vigor. That is the product for whatever it is. And it's not passed from generation to generation. So they're, they, they try to breed for what they think is an improvement. They don't understand hybrid vigor, but that's what they're getting. And then when it starts to fail over the next two generations, they figure they screwed up, something was wrong, or the blood just wasn't that great. And then they bring in new blood. It's just a hamster wheel that never ends, you know? Yeah. And, it, and here's the main characteristic of that, though, Kenny. If a lot of them knew how important purity of blood was to hybrid vigor, we would have more purity of blood out there. Okay, because to in order to get your maximum amount of hybrid bigger, you need your at least two peer families, true families of peer to get the you know the maximum out of your hybrid bigger. A lot of people doesn't know that. A lot of people yeah. has no awareness of that whatsoever. Well, it's a it's a shame that people are actually putting two birds together to get offspring, and they have no idea what they're doing. Period. There's just too many of that going on. Uh, let, let me say this. Okay, I, go ahead. I'd like to say um, that I think it would be a good idea to take some of the uh, photos that we see on Facebook and put the photo up and the silhouette up and what the true type is for American game and let everybody see what the true difference is between the two. Because you've got people out there say, oh, my God, that's such a great bird. But you, Kenny and Frank, can totally pick it apart. And a lot of the... Um, Members can too, but you know, to show people, hey, okay, this may look like a good bird to you, but let's put a type on it and show you why this isn't a good bird. Yeah, I, well, I done that a while back on the group page. We uh, need to I put do a bird up and try to fool them. Yeah, we need to do more of them because yeah. I think she's right. If they saw the difference, because sometimes they're blind, they look at the bird, they see something. I mean, 10 people can look at the same bird and see something different. OK, one sees color, one sees station, one sees, um, you know, comb type. I don't know that everybody sees something different in the same picture. But if we were to do what she said, take the silhouette of an American game, which we know, which we know is right to a silhouette to one of those others that we think are wrong, which are. And, and one of the things Frank and I have everybody knows about is we have a folder called the wall of shame. But one of the reasons we collect those pictures is not because we found one that looks bad and it makes a good example, but what gets Frank and my attention is how many likes and how many people on there make comments that they want birds from that or they want that bird. And we're like, oh my God, if you only knew it, only knew, you know what I mean? So I, I see it as a challenge because the the longer that we're out here teaching people and preparing them to be good breeders the more people will have seeing that and not pushing like and saying, okay, well, that one might have a few problems. I, I don't want to be negative because everybody is trying to have good birds and they're proud of the birds that they yeah, post on Facebook. You know, it, it's just, they aren't aware of different things they could do to make that, that strain that they have much better than what they think it is today. Frank, that's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. 
That's right. And what what I done was, and I didn't use anybody else's bird. I had one bird, and he'd come out super high in station. I mean, he had really long legs, really long uh, thighs, and his legs was in front of him. Not bad, but they were out in front of him. He wasn't a centered bird, and his wings were high. And I silhouetted, Amanda, I sil- silhouetted him out, and I put him on the group page, and everybody was just like, oh, yeah, you know, he's – it looks awesome. He's beautiful and this and that. And then I took one that had the proper confirmation and put on a side of it and post them side by side. And then they could see the difference. So uh, I think I think that does help uh, by blacking them out to where they – that's how you learn. That's, that's how you learn. You get that photograph in your mind, your brain. And once you get it there, it don't ever leave you. Once you learn the proper confirmation and type of a bird, it stays with you for always. Yeah. Yeah. Um- I'm trying to remember who it was. It was one of my, I want to call him a mentor. Um, he wasn't a mentor for very long, but he, he's the one that brought that to my attention because Tony and a number of pe- other people kept saying type confirmation, that kind of thing. And um, I thought I got it. I thought I had a good understanding, but it wasn't until this guy took different breeds, not just game fowl breeds, but domestic chicken breeds, all the different ones. I couldn't, there were probably 30 of them on this thing and they were all blackened out and they were all different. Okay. And he was like, show me which one's American game. I went right to it. He goes, yeah. Okay. Show me old English. Boom. Right. Where's the ACL? Boom. I was able to tell him, but they were so distinctive that never left my mind to, to do that. And to that helped me get a better understanding what type meant and what it, what it represented. And it was able from there, I was able to distinguish the difference between type and confirmation of body. And he always said, type is the silhouette, the overall shape of the bird, which dictates the breed. Confirmation is all its parts uh, in their proper places and proportions. Uh, and then you had, um, you know, what was the other one? Uh, carriage, which everybody is confusing carriage with station. I don't know when that started, but I'd never heard that until just recently where they were actually confusing carriage with station saying a body legs forward is a high station where legs back is a low station i never heard that before that that's a i've seen low station birds with proper carriage and i've seen uh high station birds with proper carriage okay um, we explained that uh probably like three weeks ago maybe four weeks ago now on the chart yeah. that come out that chart, chart got all out. that started that that chart right there got every bit of this started people saw it and automatically they started teaching it. What's it yeah. come out? Look at the low low station bird. Now, <laughs> if you had a low station bird, you'd be picking it up all the time because its head would be sliding on the ground. I mean, it would be tumbling. It, the weight is forward. I don't see any bird that's so – the legs are so far back like that and considered a low station bird. Um, now, they, the only one they get right is the middle, which is – the pro the closest to center. a proper confirmation, yeah, the center one than the other two. Whereas the only time I see legs that are forward like that on a so-called high station bird, when the carriage is wrong, look at the back, look how far sloped the back is. Now I've seen some carriage, I've seen some high station. Let's see, where if you look at some of these, look at the one on the far uh right bottom. Bottom. Okay, so that's a high station. Okay. Uh, look at the one just kitty corner to the left. High station, but the carriage is still, it's not upright like it was. And look how centered the legs are under that body. So this idea of looking at it like this is crazy. I, someone just made it up. This is something made out of the top of their head, you know, because this isn't, this isn't, how, this isn't the different. Okay, how do I say this? This is the difference between type confirmation carriage when you understand all three of those and you can you see the difference and you can select accordingly accordingly you're going to have a good bird now if you're paying attention on just high station but might not paying attention to the carriage or confirmation you're going to have a bird that's out of proportion it's not going to be right okay so I, it just i don't know some people let, are teaching crazy things these days let me ask you this kenny what's the difference between station and carriage Station is the, uh, and I know people hate to hear this, but station is the length of the leg. And the way to determine the station is not just the length of the leg, but the comparison between the thigh and the shank. So if you have a a shank, a lot of times here's what it is for a bird that's really high station. A lot of times the shank is longer than the thigh. 
Okay. Somewhere in the a medium station, the, the thigh is slightly longer than the shank. Okay. Now, a low station is when you have a thigh that's extremely long with a very short shank. You want basically what you want is a thigh that's slightly longer than the shank. Okay. And for a lot of us, we don't look at it like I don't like the so called medium station. I kind of, but I usually tell people I'm kind of in the realm of a medium high. I want a little taller. I want a little more athletic athletic uh, uh, posture than the other ones. So that's what I look for. But that's how you determine the station right there. Yeah. And, and not only that, when you, you take that thigh and you elongate it, you make it longer. You're weakening that whole yeah. bird, the structure right. of that bird. So uh, a lot of people doesn't take that in consideration as well, Nancy. Uh, they like the tall birds, but it's weakened the, the, you know, what Kenny explained there. When you take that thigh and you stretch it, you make it as long or longer as that leg, you're just weakening the whole thing. Uh, okay, what do you mean by weakening? Point. Okay, is you're it making it balance? longer and thinner. Yeah. Right. You're making right. it longer, but, does that but thinner. Make him off balance. I mean, oh, yeah. in what way are you weakening it by the strength muscle, by stretching the muscle and length? Muscle. Think of it like okay. this: when you have a medium station bird, you have a nice. I want to use the word drumstick. It's the thigh, basically, but you have a nice meaty drumstick on there. Okay, when they get shorter, they tend to be even more meatier, but have a shorter shank. Okay, when you the, like Frank said, when you get them taller, invariably, almost all the time you get thighs that are so stretched out, there's almost no muscle around the, those legs at all. And when you lengthen them, you um, you diminish the muscle and you weaken the legs. Even okay. the bone. Even the bone. Right down to the bone. Uh, the bone's longer. The whole thing is longer. Now, you're, I shouldn't say this, but the only birds I've seen were, and these aren't actually great specimens, maybe the one on the far left, where they have, and, and Frank said it too, is these are big birds. These are big huge. size, huge birds that have a lot of meat on them. Okay. So a lot of times they can kind of get away with it. Where if you look at the one on the left, it's got actually not, not bad. I mean, I'm, I might want to see a little more meat on the bone there as far as the thigh, but you can see there's a little more meat. Now that doesn't mean you guys should all run out and buy Peruvian birds because everything else about the bird is wrong. If you want Peruvian, buy Peruvian, breed Peruvian, but don't mix it with your American game because the overall type is completely wrong. Kenny, let me ask you this. When you're talking, put the picture back up. When you're talking, you know, the left or the right, are you talking about the black bird or are you talking about, about the red? The red, red okay. on my left, yeah. Okay. Just so people yeah. don't get confused. Yeah. But even Peruvian, you know, I mean, look at, these are three different confirmations. Three different types, and it's supposed to be the same breed. So even they're getting it wrong, you know. I don't think that one on the the far right, the black bird, is a Peruvian, though. It looks yeah. like it, but I don't believe it, it is. is. Okay, it, it might not be. Um, yeah, I think, I think I might it not. might be supposed to be a American game, but it, it looks a lot like it, though. It does. It came from a Peruvian breeder's website. Probably a mix, then. Okay, could be. I would say. You know. Um. Yeah. So uh, the, the biggest question of all is uh, how do we keep them pure? <laughs> you know, it's one thing to get them pure. How do we keep them pure? Frank, what do you think? You know, my old saying, Kenny, I said <laughs> it takes, this is my saying. It takes a good breeder to make his own strain and a true pure family, but it takes a great breeder to maintain them and keep them that way for years without adding outside blood. Yeah. It's as simple as that. When you think about it, it's just don't add outside blood. Uh, some people, they they uh, they just can't help themselves. They ju they're just not seeing the progress fast enough. We have a saying in the Breeders' Academy, if the offspring are bearing the parents each generation, you're moving in the right direction. And sometimes that's not good enough for people. They actually have the thought that they should see perfect birds. They should get two birds and see perfect offspring. And if they don't, there's something wrong. And that's just not how it works, okay? So... The idea of getting them pure is one thing, and we told you the criteria earlier, but do everything you can to prevent ca contamination, and contamination can happen in many ways, okay? I can tell you the reason, though, Kenny, hmm. the, why they add the outside blood. To, because I can give they, you <laughs> they can't maintain them. They don't know how to maintain them. So yeah. they line breed, well, they line know. breed, they line breed, they start going downhill. So, you know, three years comes in, they look like crap. They say, okay, I'm going to add new blood. 
They had new blood. The hybrid bigger kicks in. Boom, they're back off to the races again. Two or three years later of lion breeding, they do the same thing. That's that's the uh, that's the round of it. That's that's why they do it because or, they can't maintain them. Yeah, or they can get them to a state of purity. Then they freak out because they think they're too pure, too inbred. And then they add the new blood. Yeah. Okay, they didn't know what to do at that point. They got to the point when. Uh, there's certain points of any breeding program, and the and the founders program is no exception. You can either there are points in that program where you are going to make the strain, or you're going to ruin it, and you got to get those right. And most programs out there, like so called five eighths, three eighths, a seven eighths method, the one sixteenth infusion method, they always have a point when they're actually making some progress, and then they destroy themselves. They self sabotage themselves, and they they uh, don't know where to go from there. And then they're starting over each time. So their the idea is not only prevent like contamination, which could be infusion, could be crossbreeding, but when you do those things, basically what you're doing is you're recombinating the genes, and you're changing the strain forever. And that's where the travesty is, if you ask me. Well. The number one thing is, and Kenny, you've heard me say this millions of times. If a breeding program, if your breeding program doesn't go in a complete circle, it's useless. Throw it in the garbage. Yeah. Don't, do not use it. It must go in a complete circle. And when I mean circle, I mean the maintaining part. Nobody yeah. can maintain the birds. I almost screwed up because I almost put that new banner that I created that shows that. You know? <laughs> yeah, you might not want to do that one. Oh my God, I went through a loop there. What am I doing? You know, I keep forgetting where I'm at, you know. So, uh, yeah, save that to the back members. end. Yeah, that's a member uh, illustration that just gives out the farm right there, you know. So, hey, <laughs> you know, uh, another thing people have a problem with that don't understand what you're saying uh, purity, pure, pure blood. They don't understand what you mean by pure. You're like, oh, no, 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 no. You can never have a strain that's pure. You know, like Italian people, you can't have this Italian and that Italian and they go together and then you've got a pure Italian, no outside English or Mexican or Scandinavian, well, Nancy, anything like that. Look at, look, look at these cattle breeders, okay? Look at the cattle breeders. Look at the dog breeders, okay? Look at all these different dogs we got. You don't call a right. Dalmatian a German Shepherd. Or that that's one thing I always send them to when they say there's no such thing as purity of blood. I say, okay, look at your domestic animals. Tell me there's no purity of blood then. Yeah. Well, Robert Bakewell showed us that purity of blood is possible and that it should be sought after. He brought the science. Everybody's afraid of that word science. He brought the science into breeding. He showed us that we could take, because at the time that he was discovering this, they were doing what we see a lot right now. They're just bringing in new blood. They're doing experimentation. They're seeing what they, it's like the, let's see what we get game. Let's breed this in there. See what we get. Not knowing at all the genetic factors that the, what they're actually looking for, they're not going to get because it's working against them all the time. But he brought the science in the breeding. And then he showed that there's certain breeding methods that actually not only make it work, but they're a necessity. Mm -hmm. And once I learned that, along with the, uh, the studying evolution, the mechanisms of evolution, and uh, then I compare him and see the association that it has with uh, selective breeding, boy, it's like I tell everybody, the light just went on. It was like all of a sudden I could see. And it just made all the difference, put it in the practice, checked it out, worked, put it through the test with other people. That became the, uh, the foundation of the Founders Program. And uh, the race was on, you know, but Nancy was asking what makes purity of blood? Well, we we're talking about it earlier. Same. It's the, it's the other side of the coin. When it comes to adding or infusing new blood, you're basically losing predictability, uniformity, consistency, repeatability. But those are also the same criteria that make it, uh, that determine whether it is a pure blood, which is, are they predictable? Are they uniform? Are they consistent? And can you repeat them? So whenever no, I people mean, ask me, I mean, that's an easy question for me to answer. And it usually leaves them speechless. So, you know. no, yeah, right. And, and I know you said the answer. What I'm saying is there are people out there that have a problem with that word. And they, they don't understand mm -hmm. what you mean by purity of blood. That's Those are saying. the same people, uh, Nancy, that don't believe in inbreeding as well. And yeah. to, to have a pure family, 
that has to be. You cannot have, to me, my opinion, I don't know about, I'm, I'm thinking Kenny thinks the same way that I do. Oh, yeah. You cannot have a pure family, a true pure family without inbreeding. You just can't do it. It's well, impossible. Robert Bakewell said the same exact thing. He says you cannot create a pure strain without having some inbreeding. Some inbreeding has to be in there. Now, the problem is, is we could say inbreeding is important, but unless you know where the inbreeding happens and how long you do it and and uh, which birds you're inbreeding, I mean, understanding inbreeding properly, uh, you're not going to get there because we say it all the time. Inbreeding is one of those things that if you don't understand it, don't do it. Stay away okay? from it. But if you do, it's the greatest tool you'll ever use. It is. And yeah, you like cannot create a strain without it. Pacello has a great question, and I told him we'll answer that on in the inside of the Breeders Academy is what's the disadvantage yeah. of the inbreeding mating? But we're going to answer that one inside the Breeders Academy. And after the, the, we, it, Kenny just told it. We, we just said it. Not knowing how to do it properly, that's, that is the disadvantage right there. I can go <laughs> okay. more in detail on that. Matter of fact, uh, if he's a member of the Breeders Academy, go into the inbreeding program and that'll tell you tell you uh, why it's important. It'll tell you the pros and cons. It'll tell you the goods and the bads, what to do, what not to do. And um, I'm, it's one of those programs that, and I plan to do that too. Is is um, I'm always going in there improving it. And matter of fact, uh, we're going to be covering that one sometime next year or pretty soon, maybe. And uh, and I'm going to work on it a little more because I'm always improving my programs, you know, because even though I have the material on the Breers Academy, when I take on a subject, even one I've already done, I go and research it again and I find out new things and, uh, and then I improve my programs. So that's one of the things we're going to be doing is uh, we'll be tackling that topic because I do think it's that important and I will be improving it. So well, you also, you go into greater detail. Yeah. A oh yeah. More. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what do you select for when you're trying to keep a family pure, Frank? Health, vigor. Has to be, well, as we always say, we put it in the number one. Health, confirmation, and type. That's it. You know, it, both of them is so important. They should just have a slash in between them and be number one. <laughs> yeah. I guess yeah. you could say. I mean, if you look at the standards, they always say type and confirmation is number one. Depending on the standard, they may just say type and just assume confirmation. You look at some other books where it just says confirmation and doesn't ex include type. They I, they assume they're the both, both the same thing. But as I've told you before, uh, type and confirmation are important. They kind of share that spot equally, uh, but they're very different from each other. Okay, uh, But like Frank said, uh, you can't breed or prove a family or do anything if you're not dealing with healthy birds. So although the books will say type and confirmation, number one, we always place health and vigor as number two. I mean, uh, number one, you know, and then we move on from there. But uh, so Frank's right on the money, but I'd also include um, what you want to see as you're selecting them. You're, uh, you're looking for less variation. Okay. You're looking for lower genetic diversity, uh, more uniformity. So you're always looking for, you kind of get an idea of what you want them to look like, what kind of confirmation type they should have, the color plumage. And you're always selecting birds that are like that. Okay. And each generation, you're fine tuning them to the point when you see the family starts getting bigger and bigger, and yet they still have the same color. You know, a handful of people have been on my yard, not very many, Frank being one of them. Chase helps me around the farm here. So he uh, he's seen my birds. And those guys could tell you that my birds all look alike. There's no variation within them. You're not going to see huge differences between my hens. You're not going to see huge differences between my cock. So uh, We was uh, at the farm yesterday, and Amanda was looking up in the trees inside the fenced-in area. And I've got my hens all free ranging right now. They go in and out of the lot, but at night they come in the lot and they get up there and she goes, if I had to pick a particular hen, I'd be here all night. And I said, why don't she goes, they all look the same. They're identical to each other. You know? And I said, that's the ideal of it. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yep. That's that. That's when you know you're on the right track. Yeah. Was when you're doing that. So what's he saying, Nancy? Or well, he's saying that know. some do it with two breeds, saying, say like Albany and Gray, crisscross them, call them pure before five years. Yeah, they just don't understand the process at all. 
those guys are just producing birds. They don't understand the breeding process. They don't understand what it takes to actually create a strain. They're basically getting hybrid vigor until it runs out, and then they start all over again. Um, uh, it's a shame that we don't see more real breeders out there, if you ask me. Well, Kenny, you know, we'll get there. I will say this. I will say this, and I think you and Nancy will agree with me. There's very few people that you can go to these days to sell you a true family. And I bet you anything, when you get them home, that first hatch, uh, that first clutch of chicks that comes out, that's going to be the first telltale sign right there because they're going to be chip month, white, you know, not chip month, white chip month. That's your first indication right there. Get them, breed them. And a lot of times they tell on the parents, the offspring will every time. Yeah. And people don't realize that. They don't see the the telltale signs. They don't see the clues. And we say that all the time that the offspring will tell you everything you want to know about the parents every time. They'll tell you the past, the present, the future. Okay. And it's that's part of being a breeder. And what we teach at the Breeders Academy is dis, um, distinguishing uh, what those uh, offspring are telling you. Uh, because you could get, you could breed them. And I've had members send me pictures where they bred, they got a, a pair from somebody, they bred them and the offspring were all over the board. They had every, they had like a dozen chicks and every, almost every chick was a different color. And it, it just shows that they thought they bought a pure family, but they didn't. They bought birds or either mongrels had all kinds of bloodline, different bloodlines in them, or the birds that they were bringing weren't even related. And they were told they were actually related. So, and then they also learned that when they look at the offspring with the wide genetic diversity like that, huge variation, that it's not the end of the world. That there was something in the parents that they did like, or they wouldn't have bred them. Okay. So it's a, it's about looking at the offspring that are produced, taken from the offspring where you, and deciding what direction you want to go, pick the two that will get you there, get rid of everything else, and then start working on them. And uh, that's, the, that's the key. You know, that it's not always... Um, uh, it's not always bad news exactly. We can always work with it. I always say you could build a strain of any cock and hen. Just got to know what to do, you know. And, you know, uh, the time factors in it too. Uh, yeah. You know, some, some there's more work in, some there's less work in. But I'll tell you what really disappoints me with all this crossing and mongrelizing and what have it is what we have done to the the silver Wheatons and the duck wing gray, silver grays. Uh, that is, I mean, they're almost gone if they're not already. I mean, that's the reason I've been trying so hard. And a couple of other guys is on board with me trying to do the same thing. They're trying to get a family to where we can get them back and call them true silvers. Uh, about any of the birds you see on Facebook or anybody's farms right now, you can see the rust coming out of the red that's in the birds. Now, a lot of people see them and says, oh, I don't see what you're seeing. It's, I see a silver wheat or a, um, a silver duck wing, they don't see that rust colored, but they compare it to another picture and they're all, oh, I, I see what you're talking about right now. But that's been the biggest uh, dilemma that, that I've seen as far as them adding blood to it. They've, they've just destroyed the, 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 all the silver grays. Seems like. Yeah. It's uh I hate it when uh, <laughs> I'll get a member and they show me um, silvers with a lot of red in them. And they want to make a family from that. And I have to be the bearer of bad news that uh, getting where they want to go is going to be really tough, you know, and it's going to take really understanding the breed, understanding uh, what the hens should look like, you know, being that the silver wing being very different than the um, silver duck wing. A lot of times they're trying to mix the two and sometimes they don't realize the two are different, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, it's a shame. That when I see somebody just starting, and that's what they're starting with, I always try to talk them out of it. That's not something you want to start out with, because I'll just be honest with you. That would be enough to, you know, you go a, a, a couple breeding seasons with it. You might just throw your hands up and say, I'm done with this. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to wrap this up with this last one, which is uh, why is purity of blood so important? And I'm going to run through them real quick. And uh, because... You know, a lot of people don't understand that not only purity of blood, a reachable goal, but why it's important. And uh, that is when you get them to a point of sta uh, a state of purity, a lot less, sometimes no surprises. I don't see surprises in my birds. Okay. Again, like we talked about, they're predictable. Um, you're going to have a family that repeats themselves generation after generation. Less culling. 
that's a, that's a really good one because you're not going to have as many coals. You're not going to be calling for the typical things. You've been working on them over time. They're healthier than most. They're repeating themselves. You're, you're seeing after time because you're weeding through some of the defects and eliminating them as you're going. You're going to see less defects. So there's no reason to call there. It's going to say, and Nancy's a big one for this one. It's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of money. Okay. So. Oh, and then uh, your birds, what's the neat part is, and we talk about this a lot of times where Frank and I can have the same, as far as what the criteria is, uh, the breed, we could have the same black breasted, light red family. But because of our eye, they represent their breed properly, but there's going to be something unique about them that's different than each other. And that's the fun part is when you have a bird that does represent re represent its breed, has a bright type, type confirmation, uh, color, but yet you stand them next side by side with another person's bird that does match the same criteria and yet they're different. And that's the, that's the fun part of it. And that's a perfect point, Kenny, to why the name game shouldn't be used now because they, they've went through so many hands, so many different people that could breed people that couldn't breed and they've been changed so much. Uh, they're, they're not, those names are gone forever. Now it may be what they derive from, what they come from. Okay. I'll give you that. But, they're not none of those birds exist anymore by those names. Yeah, and you can you have more options too. You can do more with pure family. Okay. And it's a family when someone walks in your yard and sees a family that represents its breed rot, right? And they all look the same. People want them. They'll do anything to get your birds. Okay. And that would to me, that means you can get more money for them legitimately. Okay. And people's got pure uh families that way. That's Kenny's described as far as being pure. Those are the ones that are harder to come by. A lot of people don't want, want to let their birds go. They they know what time and money they have put into those birds over the years. And they're they're hard to turn loose. They really are. Yeah. Okay. This has been a great session. I don't want to go too far over. We got to get to the back end. I want to thank you guys for joining us. Hopefully you'll become members of the Breeders Academy. I'll see you members in the back end. Even if you're not going to uh, join the Breeders Academy for now, make sure to go to www.breedersacademy.com. Join my newsletter, which is my Breeders Bulletin. You're going to get a lot of great information, a lot of free eBooks. And then from there, you can decide whether you're going to be a member. We've got a great deal coming up for Black Friday. And like I told you, the website's open. So if you want to join, go ahead and join. So we'll see you guys on the back end. We'll see the rest of you guys next week. Thanks a lot. Bye. Have a good weekend, guys.
Yeah.